This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 266, recorded on January 3rd, 2014, finally in an even year. Hi, everybody. (laughs) I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. So it's really cold here. It was minus 5 Fahrenheit this morning, which is minus 20 Celsius. So as I said to Vincent earlier, we could keep our enzymes outside, <laughs> store our samples out there. But don't keep your, uh, your drinks outside. It'll freeze. Right. Yeah, here we have um, currently minus 9 Celsius. We have about 8 inches of fresh snow last night, and it is going to go down at 1 a.m. to minus 17 Celsius. Pretty cold. Also joining us today from western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. You cold? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's 12 Fahrenheit right now. Um, so we had, uh, had about 8 inches of snow last night. <clears throat> And for those of you in metric countries, that's uh, about that much. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, getting cold. We're we're only supposed to get down to minus nine tonight, though. So minus nine Celsius? Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Uh, this is getting confusing, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we also got about the same amount of snow. Um, did any of you guys shovel your snow or anything like that? Oh yeah. Yes. Ours started on New Year's Day, and I shoveled twice then, and then again quite a lot yesterday morning. So, Alan, you? Yeah, yeah, I shoveled off the driveway this morning. Actually, I think my pick this week is going to be related to that. I didn't do it yet. I didn't want to get tired for Twiv. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I only have so much energy. <laughs> I want to expand it. I'll That's why on. we're doing a hangout because you couldn't get out of your driveway, so you're stuck in your house, right? That's good. And in fact, that we are doing this as a hangout again, which technically isn't. The greatest, uh, the audio, for those of you who just listened to the audio, you'll notice that the quality is not up to what you're used to, and I apologize, but, and when Google records it, they compress it highly, and uh, we're all on one channel, and I can't do much in post-production. And the video is also funny. Sometimes there's a lag uh, between the audio and the video, which I maybe presume... Maybe you could contact the NSA and they could send us a higher quality copy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, Alan, your your audio and video are perfectly in sync last time, so you must have a really good connection. I guess I do. That hasn't been typical here, but um, it's nice to know. <laughs> yeah. I remember you you had that horrible internet experience some time ago, so they fixed it. Yes. All right. So that's what we're doing, a Google Hangout today. And uh, I want to just, you know, yesterday was my birthday. I was 61 yesterday. And I want to show you uh, one of my birthday presents here. Let's see if I can. Yes. <laughs> yes, Excellent. my brother sent the Facebook picture to me, too. So. so this is uh, my. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I had gone to Urban Outfitters with my daughter, and we saw this. And I said to her, "You know, you could get that for me." So she got it, and uh, it's supposed to be a terrarium. Actually, it has a uh, has a little one of the icosahedral faces actually opens, and uh, no. so you see, this is a very nice icosahedron. You're supposed to put dirt and plants in it, I guess. You have a nice icosahedral structure. There are 12 triangular faces and um, nice nice five-fold axis of symmetry right there. I'm not getting this video business right. Here we go. <laughs> five-fold axis of symmetry. I intend to put inside this a viral genome that Ann Palmenberg is making for me. Great. I don't know if you remember. She's going to bead the polio virus genome. And uh, I'll, I'll put it in here. I'll probably just take up one pentamer as a worth of space, but I think that'll be cool. Anyway, I was thinking you could plant some vines in it, and then as they burst out the top, it would uncoat. <laughs> That's a great idea, right? All right, so I'm going to put this on the shelf here. My little tchotchke self shelf, and there you go. Anybody can, can look at it throughout the uh, podcast. It's appropriate, right? 
-hmm. Absolutely. It's a, there's also a caricature of me from my son, uh, which I will I will hide because it's not very good. If it, is not, it is good because it looks just like me, but I don't want you to see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have um, some follow-up. Uh, Ken Stedman, a virologist in Oregon, who we had on a TWIV last year, writes, a wonderful end-of-year podcast based on your discussions of the giant viruses live, TWIV 261. I wanted to share my recent attempt at broader communication about viruses in the universe from the New Scientist Holiday Edition. Moreover, I think that Eugene Koonin at the NCBI would be a great TWIV guest. He has very interesting theories about virus origins, some of which I agree with. <laughs> Another great potential guest would be Patrick Fortaire, who has some other ideas about virus origins. So we will definitely get Eugene on. <laughs> nice the way he phrased that. Patrick Fortaire, who has some other ideas about it, and then doesn't comment on whether he agrees with any of them. Yeah. So it's nice to read between the lines, isn't it? Well, we'll get them both on. As the Germans say, have a nice slide, guten Rutsch, into the new year. How do you say that? Does anyone know? Uh, guten Rutsch. Guten Rutsch. 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 Okay. Does that, that just means nice slide? Let's Evidently. See. A good is guten. And right, good, good tag is good day. So, yeah. so I, I search Google and I get an image of a bear sliding down a slope. Guten <laughs> 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 Rutsch. All right, thank you, Ken. He's, so he sent this article, and I, the new scientist is uh, is that open to everyone? I Anyone don't know? know. I had to try to get it last night through the library, and the library hadn't posted it yet. So, uh, oh, I remember then too. You could. You could join and see the past 20 years, and you could subscribe for only 25 bucks. So it's not expensive. Okay. So. so this is an article just published January 1st by Ken. It's called Forgotten Aliens, We Should Hunt for Viruses in Space. So the basic idea is if an alien came to Earth, they would probably take some seawater back with them because that's... <laughs> that's what makes up most of the planet when you see it from space. And that alien would find... Uh, in a mill of seawater, 10 million viruses. So his idea is, since there's so many viruses on Earth, more than anything else, why doesn't NASA or the European Space Agency look for viruses on other planets? And then he talks about how you would detect them, which is the hard part, because um, you can't bring an electron microscope out to outer space, so he says you're going to have to look for nucleic acids. And he talks about his, his laboratory... Uh, trying to find nucleic acid sequences in very old samples. I mean, this is the problem. No, fossilized microbes more than 3 billion years old have been found. No viruses have ever been reported. Is that because they can't be detected, or are there none, or has nobody looked? So he's working on trying to find sequences, I presume, in old samples, which would really be interesting because you could get some very ancient rocks on Earth and see if there are viruses in them. Yeah. And, and he's kind of trying to do it um, coming from the other direction. He's trying to see if you can take viruses and coat them in silica, sort of make your own fossils or the first step in it, then could you recover anything like viruses? So in other words, if there had been something like that formed, would we be able to you know, find it? And um, so they, so he's working on that, and so they've, they've coded some viruses. Right. Anyway, um, and then uh, this is for me. It was coincidental because in the New York Times uh, science section there was an article by Ken about some work by Ken Stedman, where they're working on coding viruses again with silica to try and uh, make them more stable as a way of uh, eliminating the need for the cold chain in vaccines. So um, that uh, was a pretty cool finding hmm. uh, or a, a approach. And uh, it said it worked somewhat for phage. And I can't remember uh, what the result was so far for pox. But they tried several different viruses. So that uh, link was in the New York Times. It's an interesting comment he makes. Apparently, there are 100 kilograms of Martian meteorites on Earth. And he said, you know, if we can get this down, uh, 
it would be interesting to look in them. Although, I presume they've impacted Earth, so they're right. probably contaminated, right? Right. He does talk about the contamination problem a little bit, which is why he was saying, yeah, you can't really send up a electron microscope, but maybe you could have robots doing these, looking for these signatures of uh, fossilized viruses. Yeah, and with a meteorite, you might be able to um, put it in a sterile environment and drill into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Find something yeah. inside. Yeah. And he says in 20 to 30 years, when uh, people return from a Mars mission, hopefully that people will look for uh, viruses in them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's not something that space um, trips focus on, right? They never they talk about microbes, but not viruses. Right. Interesting. Anyway, it's a cool article. If you can get a hold of it, take a look. It's kind of neat. So thanks for that, Ken. And um, we have so our first story. That was only that's the only follow-up we had. Oh wait, I had one. You have I one. I wanted to comment. Um, we because we were talking about the E. coli spreads last week, and I couldn't dredge up the name of the person who I thought was responsible for most of those images. And uh, talking to Sarah French, she reminded me that it was uh, Ruth Kavanoff, and Ruth Kavanoff worked at UCSD. Uh, a lot of the time, she was associated with Bruno Zim's lab, but she had a lot of those early E. coli spread pictures, and and the deal was that because she used a different kind of technique, not a formamid-based technique, but one that uh, is aqueous with uh, particular salt concentrations, she could get really good spreads. And um, she, had a, she had started a company called Designer Genes, and so the famous uh, E. coli spread that's on postcards and t my t-shirt last week and so forth were all part of that company. And that company then was, uh, or uh, those things were distributed by Carolina Biological Supply, but I wasn't able to find any of those on the Carolina Biological Su uh, Supply website. But she was featured in Nature for having this business, and every time she would send out these things, postcards, t-shirts, whatever, she would have some background information about DNA. So she was doing some science outreach in the process of sending those out. So that's the story on the E. coli spreads, at least. And, and I think somebody else is responsible for the classic one where you can see a T4 right in the middle of the image of the DNA spread around it. Right. So. Ah, so she went to Reed College. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can find a lot about her if you just Google her. Apparently, mm -hmm. lots of stuff. Cool. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. she died in 1999. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, thank you for that. That's good. All right, so one of our stories was suggested by a listener, Michael, who wrote, long-time listener, first-time emailer, just came across this article and recalled that this topic has been discussed recently on TWIV. A journalist wrote about her experience with three personal genome sequencing companies, and they each came back with differing interpretations, everything from the semantics of how the results were described to which SNPs were used as predictors by each company. Thoughts, regards, and a sincere thank you for all of your time and efforts. Mike from the University of Washington in Seattle. Weather 46 Fahrenheit and foggy. So uh, actually someone had pointed this article out to me on New Year's. It was in the New York Times on December 30th. It's called, I Had My DNA Picture Taken with Varying Results, and it's written by Kira Paykoff. And indeed, this individual, Kira, sent uh, her samples to three different companies, and it, one, that includes 23andMe, which we've talked about here on TWIV because I had sent my family's samples to 23andMe, <laughs> and she got widely different interpretations of <laughs> of her results, so I thought we would just chat about this a bit. So for 23andMe, you send saliva, which is really uh, nice because your saliva has cells in it. They extract DNA. And then the other two companies, um, I think one of them, she had to have blood taken. Um, and I'm not sure about the other one. And they are different prices. So the 23andMe is $99. GTL charged twelve hundred and eighty-five dollars for a for and you needed a professional to draw blood. Pathway charged three ninety-nine, 
but I don't know uh, how how she got the sample, the pathway. Uh, it looks like it's a saliva test kit. Also saliva. All right. So yeah, and there was a there was a wrinkle in this. Apparently, in New York State, it's illegal to um, yeah. to send uh, to to an uncertified lab. Um, so she had some relatives in New Jersey mail her test samples out for yeah. her. Yeah, that's right. You, you can't. New York State has a law against that. So basically, what these companies do, they look for it's called SNP genotyping, S N P, single nucleotide polymorphisms. They don't sequence your genome. They look for these changes by different techniques. It's basically a hybridization technique. So a SNP is our SNPs are changes in our genome sequence. They happen about once in, in every 300 nucleotides. So there are about 10 million in the human genome. And they can be used as markers. So the SNPs not, do not necessarily, let's say you have a disease, the SNP may be in a gene that causes the disease, which is good, but it may not be. It may be close to it, in which case the SNP or the, the base change often goes with the disease. So in, if you look at a variety of people with a certain condition, many of them may have that same polymorphism, that same mutation, but some of them may not, and yet they still have the disease because, again, the SNP may or may not be in the gene that's causing the disease. Is that right. a reasonable uh, mm -hmm. interpretation? Yeah, so geneticists would say that certain, certain SNPs co-segregate with a particular trait or, or disease, and there was um, a Back in the, I guess in the 90s, there was a big push to uh, sequence and identify as many SNPs as possible and as many different people as possible uh, for for clinical studies and uh, these these sort of survey projects to see if you could find SNPs that correlated with particular types of diseases. Um, and then that morphed into, you know, once those projects had met their goals of sequencing a certain number of SNPs in the human genome, um, then they, they had all these um, sequencing machines and people standing around idle because they'd finished the project. And so they, they morphed that into these whole genome association studies um, where they're kind of doing the same thing and, and still trying to find um, variants in the genome that will somehow allow you to predict risk for particular conditions. And one of the uh, hypotheses going in uh, was pretty much disproven. And the hypothesis was that common diseases would be associated with common SNP variants. And in fact, that hasn't been the case. So some people think of it as a, a huge amount of money that was expended with not as much success as they wanted. But there have been um, some successes with these studies. They're, they get abbreviated GWAS for genome-wide association studies. And in fact, doing those, uh, creating those dense SNP maps for all kinds of organisms um, is helpful. So there's really dense SNP map uh, databases available for the mouse. I was recently at a conference about horse diseases. Uh, wouldn't surprise you that this conference was in Kentucky. And uh, there's a good SNP database for horses and so forth. So people have done the GWAS studies, for instance, in horses, and we heard a talk where a large consortium is trying to identify particular horse traits with um, those SNPs. So the, base, the way these companies do the assay is they have on a, a chip, a glass slide or the equivalent, they have many oligonucleotides uh, stuck on, and each one is in the area of a SNP, and if you have the particular mutation, your DNA will hybridize and give a sequence, give a signal. So it's a hybridization-based assay. They're not actually sequencing your DNA. But as far as I understand, the actual analysis, this um, SNP genotyping, is is reliable. Um, right. The fact, the part about detecting the SNPs is reliable. They can say you have these SNPs. Right. So the, for 23andMe, you can go on their website and you can see they use what's called the Illumina Human Omni Express 24 format chip, which consists of a fully custom panel of probes for detecting SNPs, and uh, that's how it works. And I assume the other two companies do the same thing. So it's not really the detection of the SNP that is the problem. In fact, if we saw the raw data, I would guess that they would all pretty much be in agreement 
but again, they may be looking at different SNPs as well, right? Yes. Right. Uh, but the interpretation is the issue. You know, what does it mean to have a certain polymorphism with respect to a disease like rheumatoid arthritis or obesity or anything else? I mean, in, as far as I know, there are very few SNPs which are predictive. In, in other words, if the change is in a gene, so the BRCA mutations in genes that predict uh, whether you will have breast cancer or not. As far as I understand, those are highly predictive of getting breast cancer. Is that correct? Yes. I'm, yes. Yeah, so and, those and this, this, by the way, is, is just really, fundamentally, this is just an update of a very, very old concept in genetics, looking at co-segregation of traits. Yeah, right. Um, so you, you know, Mendel did this with pea plants, and and other geneticists have done it with various species. And if you have a cat that has white hair and blue eyes, odds are it's deaf, and it's because those traits co-segregate in the genome. And now the SNPs um, serve as a as a genetic marker, as a genomic marker um, that is well distributed throughout the genome. So as Kathy was saying, they're a useful tool. You can see what pieces of the genome are moving around during matings. Um, and if you have a trait that co that that segregates cleanly, um, like a BRCA2 trait or other some other um, one or two gene trait, then you can tr you can trace that and say, oh, okay, this allele of that gene does give you high risk, and we know you have this allele because you have this pattern of SNPs. Um, what hasn't panned out, uh, what a lot of geneticists kind of said wouldn't pan out even going into it, was the idea that that you could um, you could just do these uh, genome-wide association studies and find the the correlates of these very very common conditions heart disease various types of cancer and and, and what have you um, and that's a much harder problem because you're potentially looking at the segregation of of thousands of different genes and all the other stuff right so basically the problem is that for SNPs that are not actually in the gene which are not causing the disease, some people can have the disease and not have the SNP, and that can, com that can complicate it as well. Yeah, and you could have a disease that that's, has a genetic root, but the genetic root is based on uh, 50 different genes, and you're yeah. not going to detect yeah. that in a, a SNP-based analysis. Right. And then finally, of course, there's the environmental influences, uh, which can influence the, the penetrance of various diseases as well. Right. Right. She cites that genes can account for as low as 5 to 20 percent of the whole picture. And also that um, they're testing only for a small fraction of the genetic risks, not for the rare genetic variants that confer the risks. So um, yeah. I, I found it interesting that she was able to interview Craig Venter about her results for, for this article. And uh, he said he wasn't really surprised anything short of sequencing is going to be short on accuracy and even then there's almost no comprehensive data sets to compare to. So a really nice uh, analogy I thought was that in doing these SNP analysis it's like um, this is Robert Klitzman's uh, example if you take a book and you looked at only the first letter of every other page that's kind of what you're doing when you're looking at SNP genotyping of a genome. It's not the same as sequencing all the DNA. There's lots of stuff in between that gets left out. Right. So basically if she had asked anyone, any of these people ahead of time, they would have told her that you will get probably different results from different companies, right? Right. Yeah, I like who Dr. Kaplan says, if you want to spend money wisely and you have a few hundred dollars, buy a scale, stand on it, and act accordingly. <laughs> 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 I think that's great. Yes. <laughs> it's really entertainment, he says. Now, why did I do it? Um, so I had all of these, uh, I knew of these limitations. I was hoping for our, our younger son who has some disease issues that we would find that we would get lucky and something would jump out, but nothing did. But after that, what I found that was really cool, and there's a part that's not really discussed in this article, is the um, inheritance, uh, what is it called? Genealogy, which you can learn from this, which I think is reasonably reliable. You can find where your family came from and then people can, uh, who are your close relatives, can contact you 
And in fact, I've been contacted by a few people who are clearly related to me because one, as we exchanged emails, it's clear that their ancestors were born in the same town in, in Italy and so forth. So I find that the most interesting part. So that's kind of entertainment, I guess. But um, these SNPs are conserved in families, right? And so it would make sense that they would be useful for looking at that. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, in the end, that's why I had everybody do it. So after my younger son's results didn't tell us anything, I got some interesting uh, genealogy for him, and I said, oh, let's all do this. So we did, and it's kind of neat. But, you know, it's 100 bucks, so I understand why you might not want to do that. So anyway, that's that. I thought uh, we should talk about it because I did kind of tout how cool it was, but not for disease um, identification, with few exceptions. I think BRCA and breast cancer is one of the few results you can get from this that is actionable, right? Mm -hmm. You could do something based on that. Everything else, you really don't know anything. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah. you have a 50% increased chance of this or that. <laughs> you don't know what that means at all. Right. Yeah, and the, and the company providing the data doesn't really know that that's the case. Um, I mean, this is this is the issue that 23andMe ran into with the FDA, uh, okay. that they are they are or were um, using they were providing this as a diagnostic test. They were using words in the report that that suggested that this had diagnostic power, and the FDA's point in coming down on them was, you don't have data to support that claim. Um, and yeah, if you look at the literature, the the SNP uh, association studies didn't pan out. The uh, effort to use these as markers for anything besides these rare disease gene variants um, isn't so hot. And uh, and in some cases, like BRCA2, that we keep coming back to, um, it is it, it can be useful. But in order to get a test like that approved, you do have to go through the FDA process of having it approved, and they would have a lot of restrictions on what other kinds of data 23andMe or other companies could provide with the test. Um, so companies that do test for BRCA uh, are, I believe they're approved to provide that result and just that result. So you, you do just that test. But this is something that's going to keep coming up because we're getting to a point where everybody's going to be able to have their genome sequenced. And if companies like these who've invested in this technology aren't going to provide interpretations, people are just going to try and go and find their own interpretations from wherever on the internet. You know, quacks are us are going to set up and, and start offering to interpret people's genome data. Um, but the, the science is just not there. So we have to somehow come up with some way that people will navigate this, I guess. Yeah, in fact, if you go to 23andMe.com, you will see that they can't uh, give you any health information any longer. All they can tell you is the genealogy. You can submit your sample, but they won't tell you anything about your health risk. They will only tell you, you know, where your family came from and, and that sort of thing. I guess that's pending some sorts of negotiations with the FDA. Right. So... All right, so that's that, and um, interesting. But as technology changes, interesting things happen. I think it's neat um, that we can even do this, and the sequencing will be even, as soon as the sequencing gets down to a reasonable cost, that'll be really interesting, as you say there, Alan. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we have today a paper which was suggested last time. Actually, this was a suggestion for a paper of the year, for a story of the year for 2013 it was suggested over at facebook.com slash this week in virology and it was just published uh, at the end of 2013 online anyway so I guess the actual when does the pu actual publication date happen Alan when it comes out in paper or uh, this is well it's published when it's published online Okay, so it's a 2013 paper. We didn't discuss it, but looking at it, it looked like a really cool paper. It's called Cell Death by Pyroptosis Drives CD4 T-Cell Depletion in HIV-1 Infection. It is a nature paper. Uh, the uh, authors are Deutsch, Galloway, Zhang, Yang, Monroe, Zepeda, Hunt, Hatano, Sowinski, Munoz, Arias, and Warner Green is the PI here, and this is a group from the uh, Gladstone Institute of 
Virology and Immunology, the Department of Medicine, Department of Microbiology and Immunology, all at uh, University of California, San Francisco. Very cool paper, basically trying to figure out why in people who have HIV-1 infection, why they lose their T cells, their CD4 positive T cells, which of course eventually makes them immunocompromised and susceptible to opportunistic infection. And we don't really understand how these cells are lost. And that is what um, is the topic of this paper. Now, there, we need to have a little background here to understand this. And I thought we could just discuss a little bit about that first, because we're going to have some terms here that uh, maybe we haven't covered that much on TWIV. And so one of them are the different types of cell death. So when cells are insulted, if you <laughs> infect them or stress them or call them a bad name, <laughs> they uh, undergo different kinds of death. There is programmed cell death, which is either apoptosis or pyroptosis. Uh, and then there is necrosis. And there's actually a good page uh, over at Wikipedia. If you search for pyroptosis, they have a nice little table which differentiates those three kinds of uh, cell death. Um, so, Kathy, way back in the old days of virology, when when we when we saw s cells developing cytopathic effects after infection, that was probably a combination of apoptosis and necrosis. That would be my guess. Yeah. Yeah. Because way yeah, not too long ago, we didn't distinguish between these. We just saw CPE, right? Right. And so cell now, death. Yeah. Cell death, and now it's quite clear there are different molecular pathways uh, le leading to each of them. Right, and and just add a little bit more complication. Even in necrosis, there appears to be possibly some kind of programming. So necroptosis is slightly different. It's a subset of necrosis. That's you right. You mentioned necroptosis in the paper, so I had to look that up as well. That's right. That's right. Yes, I've heard that one as well. Okay, so uh, uh, pr proteases that are important for um, cell death and necrosis and inflammation are called caspases. That stands for cysteine aspartic proteases. It's a combination of cis and asp and aces. These are proteases that play important roles in, in cell death. We're going to talk about those. Now inflammation is another term that comes up a lot. I think we have talked about inflammation, but let's just say that right up front it's a response to infection, damage, or, or irritants. And the classic signs of inflammation, the so-called rubor, dolor, calor, tumor, which was noted by a Roman physician ages ago. Redness, pain, heat, and swelling. These are the classic symptoms of inflammation. These are caused by the movement of plasma and cells into damaged tissues. Okay, so that's what we call inflammation. Now, inflammation need not be the result of infection. So infection can lead to inflammation, but other things can as well. Right. An important mediator of inflammation is interleukin-1 beta. We're going to encounter this in this paper. Uh, it's made in cells as a precursor called pro-IL-1 beta. And in order to be cleaved, you need a caspase, caspase-1. All right, so caspase-1 plays a big role in this paper. And then uh, the inflammasome. This is a pretty recently discovered multiprotein complex in cells. It contains caspase-1, and that complex helps promote maturation of IL-1 beta. It's a component of the innate immune system and it's called an inflammasome because it activates this inflammatory cascade. So there's some kind of stimulus that act that the inflammasome senses and then leads to the to the inflammatory process. So uh, for some time it's been known that if you take cultures of human tonsils which have a lot of lymphocytes in them and you infect them with HIV the CD4 positive lymphocytes are killed, but the infection is actually non-permissive. You don't make many virions. And in these cells, that's again ex vivo cultures of tonsils, right? You take a tonsil out of a person, you put it in culture, so you're maintaining the structure. The virus gets in the cell, it reverse transcribes and makes DNA, but the infection stops there. And that DNA is sensed by the cell, it activates the innate system of the cell and that activates what was thought to be apoptosis and then the cells die all right and what they found in early studies is that the dna sensing leads to the uh, caspase 1 and 3 activation which then drives the inflammatory process and apoptosis and in a subsequent paper uh, not too long ago 
the sensor that detects viral DNA in these abortively infected lymphocytes was shown to be IFI16, interferon gamma inducible protein 16. So this is an interferon stimulated gene in ISG and it's essential for um, the death of CD4 positive T cells in abortively infected, HIV infected cells. So if you take away that, if you knock down the gene or the knock down the mRNA with siRNAs using specific ones to IFI16, you don't get cell death in these abortively infected um, tonsil cultures. Okay, so that's the background we need for this paper. So we're trying to figure out why um, CD4 positive cells are dying and in this paper they use an ex vivo human lymphoid aggregate culture, HLAC, which is basically either from tonsils or spleen tissues. So I guess tonsils you can get out of people and I guess the spleen tissue is if someone has their spleen removed, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they can infect these with HIV and what they find in these tissues is, again is that most of the cells are abortively infected. They don't make viral particles yet most of the CD4 positive T cells die and they know that in these cultures um, both caspase 1 and caspase 3 are produced and they know that caspase 1 is involved with pyroptosis as we discussed before so they're wondering if in fact it's pyroptosis and not apoptosis that's causing the death of these cells. So that's what the experiments are uh, in this paper. So they basically are infecting these cultures with, vir with HIV viruses and they're reporter containing viruses, fluorescent protein, green fluorescent protein for example, so they can monitor replication very easily. So you infect one of these cultures and no more than 4% of these cultures are or of the CD4 T cells are infected, but most of them die after four days. So you infect them, you can measure how many CD4 T cells are infected, and then uh, you can see if they're still alive. One thing that I just wanted to point out mm. here is that they had uh, shown some of this in a previous paper, but in this paper, uh, when they first point to this, it's the very first figure. Uh, I was trying to figure out how they were talking about these 4% of cells that were CD4 positive surviving because in the uh, flow plot the 4% of cells are actually CD4 low and they don't describe it in this paper but in the previous paper the reason they are CD4 cells but they're expressing low levels of CD4 because the virus has downregulated that some of the viral genes NEF, uh, VPU and envelope probably mm -hmm. uh, are involved in that so it was a little bit confusing to me until I went back to the previous paper. Okay now they take these cultures and they look at caspase 1 and 3 and what they find is that the non-productively infected CD4 T cells, in those they see activation of caspase 1, but not in the T cells that are productively infected. So remember a small amount number of T cells in these explants get infected, they produce virus so they're permissive. They don't see any caspase 1 activity in those. In caspase 3 they, they barely see, they say it's markedly less abundant, mostly found in the um, the productively infected cells. Now if you they do a lot of experiments in this paper with an inhibitor of reverse transcriptase it's called efavirenz or efavirenz it's a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor it binds to the reverse transcriptase slightly away from the active site. If you treat the cells with that inhibitor you prevent activation of both caspases. In other words you have to have production of DNA to get activation of these uh, caspases. Okay. Right. Now, next they look at IL-1 beta. Remember, IL-1 beta is a major driver of inflammation. And it's been known, of course, already which kinds of cells in the immune system produce IL-1 beta. And one thing we should point out here right away is that um, in some cells um, you can make 
so some cells make constitutively caspase one, which as soon as you make a pro IL one beta will cleave it and release it from the cell. Other cells need a second signal to activate uh, caspase one. So and one of these is is a compound called nigerisin. Okay, and that's going to come up later. So in some cells, in particular, lymphoid CD4 positive T cells, nigerisin itself will activate caspase one, and then you can that'll release uh, IL1 beta from those cells. So they looked at IL1 beta expression in these uh, tonsil and spleen explants, and what they show is that uh, these these tissues normally express high levels of pro IL1 beta. And these are found primarily in the CD4 positive T cells, not in the CD8 cells, not in the CD8 T cells, or in the B cells. The B cells, of course, the ones that are gonna, that would make uh, antibodies eventually. So these cells, again, these cells in the tonsillar explants that will be infected, the CD4 T cells are expressing high levels of pro IL1 beta. Um, many of these are CCR5 expressing. CD4 cells. Now remember, HIV, um, when it binds to cells, it binds to CD4, and then it requires a co-receptor, which can be either CCR5 or CXCR4. And here, they find that the CCR5 expressing T cells have a lot of uh, intracellular pro-IL1 beta. So they think that most of the IL1 beta released in these cultures is probably done by the CCR5 expressing uh, CD4 cells. All right, and these are the ones that are um, mainly non-permissive to infection. So they are not releasing infectious virus. Um, they are non-permissive, and they believe that these are not what they call activated. So they, they think they're memory uh, CD4 cells that are largely quiescent, and that's part of the reason why they may be uh, non-permissive. Okay, so when, when the CD4 T cells get activated, the idea is as soon as they get activated, um, then they become permissive for infection. But it's the unactivated or the quiescent ones that are non-permissive, and these have lots of pro-IL-1 beta in them. So is pyroptosis triggered in these cells? Right, so these, are, these cells are non-permissive for the HIV. infection, but HIV can get into them. That's right. Because they have the receptor, it's just, it's not going to be a productive infection for the virus. It's going to, the cell's going to die. That's correct. And they die, and the idea is that the DNA is sensed, the DNA that made by reverse transcription is sensed, and that somehow leads to death. Right. Okay, so um, they take these, the, the next set of experiments, they're using inhibitors of caspases to try and get evidence that it's pyroptosis, because remember caspase 1 is, is crucial for uh, the induction of pyroptosis. So they infect these uh, explant cultures with HIV, and then they treat them with various caspase inhibitors. So basically, if they use either a pan-caspase inhibitor, in other words, a drug that inhibits all caspases, or a caspase 1 inhibitor, they prevent the depletion of CD4 positive T cells and they say as well as the inhibitor effavirenz did. So remember that you can use an inhibitor of reverse transcription and prevent cell death. These caspase inhibitors do the same thing. And they also use an inhibitor of ne necrosis, uh, necroptosis. Now here, Kathy, here's your necroptosis. They have, a, mm -hmm. in fact, necrostatin is a specific inhibitor of necroptosis. Mm -hmm. And they find that that, that, that did not uh, affect uh, depletion of CD4 cells. Right. And necrostatin works through the RIP1 protein, which is the necroptosis pathway. That's right. It's in the necroptosis. I think it's a kinase. It is a kinase. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they also look, when, when cells undergo pyroptosis, they release specific cytoplasmic contents into, this, into the extracellular milieu. So they measure one of those lactate dehydrogenase. They could, they could, in fact, detect the release of lactate dehydrogenase from these explanted HIV-1-infected cultures, and that release is blocked by uh, the effavirenz and by a caspase-1 inhibitor, but not by a caspase-3 inhibitor. 
So basically, this is suggesting that um, ap pyroptosis is important in the death of these cells. Now, they mentioned that caspase inhibitors are not terribly specific, so they could have off-target effects. So to do that, they knock down, using siRNAs, uh, a gene that is important for pyroptosis, um, and that is either caspase-1 or a protein called ASC, which is an adapter that recruits uh, cas procaspase-1 to the inflammasome. All right, so it's important for getting procaspase-1 to the inflammasome, which would eventually be cleaved and activated the caspase-1, and that would then lead to pyroptosis. And then they had a number of negative uh, control uh, siRNAs. So they knocked down uh, the mRNAs with these uh, siRNAs, and they infect and look for cell death. So basically, they find that uh, shRNAs against caspase-1 or ASC, this adapter, will prevent cell death in HIV when infected cells. But not if you knock down caspase-3 or another component of the inflammasome called NLRP3. So basically this shows the inhibitors, the caspase inhibitors along with the siRNAs show that uh, the dying of these CD4 cells after HIV-1 infection seems to be caused by caspase-1 dependent uh, pyroptosis. They also looked at the production of IL-1 beta in the culture medium of these uh, explanted cultures because that's the prediction when you infect with HIV. If, in fact, these cells are undergoing pyroptosis, they should be releasing IL-1 beta, a pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine. And, in fact, they find that IL-1 beta is released from these cultures, and that release is, inhibitor, is inhibited by uh, pan-caspase inhibitors or by caspase-1 inhibitors. In other words, you need caspase-1 activation to get release of the IL-1 beta from these lymphoid cultures that are infected. And the last set of experiments, uh, two experiments that are pretty neat. One, they take um, lymph nodes from a person who is HIV infected. So this is not a culture that they infect, but rather a person who has HIV. They haven't yet been treated with antiviral drugs. They take a lymph node biopsy. They put that into culture. They infect with HIV, and they look for caspase-1, and in fact, plenty of caspase-1 uh, in, the, in the lymph node. They find IL-1 beta being produced in the extracellular space. So this is completely consistent with the results from their explanted cultures using um, cells from a person who is infected with HIV. That's a yeah. really nice result. Yeah. I, I think that, that kind of, I, that's one of the reasons this bumps into the category of being a nature paper as opposed to, you know, ending up someplace else that, or a more specialized journal is that they really, they brought it around and said, and found that this this is really consistent with what's going on in vivo. Yeah, I was just thinking how happy they must have been the day that they found out that they got this donor. <laughs> yes. Um, so 50-year-old immunosuppressed HIV-infected subject um, who's been was identified with HIV in 1985 and hasn't been on any any antiretroviral therapy, so that it seems like it might be a kind of a rare individual. Um, yes, and so that was really key for doing those experiments. So that must be is that someone who knew they were infected but decided not to take antiretrovirals? I that's my interpretation. Wow, yeah, yeah that's pretty rare because and I. I as part of the study, they probably had to say, hey, you know, you should be treating yourself, but they probably said, no, I don't want to be treated. Yeah, somebody, who's, somebody who's had it since 1985 has probably heard that already. Yes, many times, many, many times, yes. Right. I mean, we've talked on TWIV a long time ago about someone who died, um, one of these individuals who didn't want to be treated with antiretrovirals and, and died. Well, right. not just, uh, and this is somebody who's a, this is a long-term non-progressor. This is somebody who's still alive after not being treated with antiretrovirals, which, yeah. is, which yeah. is very, very rare. There are also progressors who don't want to be treated. I remember the yes. one we were, we talked about was someone who didn't believe that HIV caused AIDS, so would not yeah. take antiretrovirals. Yeah. But the, uh, this makes, yeah, you're right, this makes it a key finding, and it's hard to do. It's very hard to do these kinds of experiments. Can you imagine, you know, you have limited material and you don't want to mess it up? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I just cannot imagine being the person who has to do this. You have to be really <laughs> confident that you're going to get it right because you probably don't have too many shots at doing it. Yeah, you drop that coming out of the incubator, it's going to be an awkward conversation. Alan, what did you do? Yeah. <laughs> you dropped it? I think you should become a writer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would never say that. <laughs> no. no. Okay, now it turns out that there are caspase-1 inhibitors that have been tested in people because it's been suggested to be involved in epilepsy and psoriasis. So it's been in a phase two trial. It's shown to be safe and tolerated. So they took this drug. It's called VX765. That's probably not the name it'll be marketed under if it gets approved. <laughs> I like it, though. I like it. It's that. nice. It's a good one. Um, and they treat, uh, they take their infected lymphoid cultures. They, in, they uh, treat them with this drug and they infect. And they show that the treatment inhibits IL-1 beta secretion. It blocks the cleavage of caspase-1. Um, and it blocks death of CD4 positive T cells. So this, again, is perfect because we know that caspase-1 is essential for pyroptosis. They've shown in this paper that that's needed for killing of these CD4 cells. So now an inhibitor of caspase-1 blocks all of those things. The neat thing here was that treatment with this drug does not make the cultures productively infected. They don't make virus. And I don't think you would predict that, but nevertheless, if you're thinking of using this to treat people, you don't want them to be making virus after treatment. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is a good thing. This is a good sign that this might be a way to treat people. Um, and that's actually one of their main discussion points here. So one of th the two signs of, of HIV infection are this loss of CD4 T cells over time, which makes you uh, immunocompromised, and, but also this chronic immune activation. T cells are constantly being activated. They become susceptible to infection. And now you see that these cells are dying. They're releasing... Um, pro-inflammatory mediators like IL-1 beta, and that makes more for more immune, immune activation. So it's kind of a vicious cycle, they call it. So if you could interrupt that with a drug, you might have some chance of treating it, because if you, if you suppress immune activation, perhaps the virus can't replicate very well. It doesn't replicate well in these non-activated cells, and you might have a way of um, treating the, the disease. And evolutionarily, this is a pretty neat trick for the virus to have picked up. Um, you know, it needs uh, it needs activated T cells to replicate, and it ends up in a T cell that's not activated, so it's going to be a dead end, but it goes ahead and triggers an inflammation, which is going to activate some T cells for its buddies to infect. It's amazing. So it's, it's a, it's a yeah. good strategy. Yeah, this is amazing. They have a nice model in the very last figure, and uh, it might be worth readers taking a look at, uh, listeners taking a look at if they want. Um, but not only do they recruit uh, perhaps activated cells, but my understanding is that the recruitment could also just be more of the uh, non-permissive cells. In other words, the T cells can can come to the site and they might not yet be activated, so they might not get productively infected, they might get abortively infected and then perpetuate this cycle of the pyroptosis and the release of the pro-inflammatory cytokines and so forth. So it, it's good both ways. It can keep both both aspects of the system working. Right. Mm -hmm. should, we should point out that in some infections, pyroptosis is protective. Like there's good evidence in various bacterial infections that py the pyroptosis response can clear the infection. Yeah, there's but, a reason this process exists. Yes. So in some cases, it's protective, but not in the case of this pathogenic chronic inflammatory disease that's HIV-1, it does not clear the infection at all and it apparently uh, makes it even worse. So yeah, that's amazing. The, the virus has evolved to, and, and that's something Jane is now telling me I can't write. We can't say the virus has evolved to do this, <laughs> but because that sounds like it's directed evolution, right? <laughs> but with that caveat, the virus has evolved. There has been some selection for viruses that can do this. There you go. Yes. There you Are you go. okay that's with that? Nice. Yes. Yeah, that's perfect. That's how we have to rewrite it. Yeah. Yeah. 
so anyway, this is a cool discovery. So basically, the death of CD4 T cells seems to be pyroptosis, not apoptosis. And there may be a way of, uh, of blocking that as a way to block this immune activation. So they call this a pathogenic vicious cycle created by pyroptosis. Okay, I think this is a very cool paper. Uh, so mm -hmm. I thank the uh, listener over at Facebook to, who suggested this. I learned a lot because this is not something that I follow and I think it's very cool. Yeah, yeah, and the, and I, the, the way it ties the, the very basic mechanistic study, I mean, they, they start off with the question, how exactly does HIV kill the cell? And, and they get to very specific mechanisms, and then, and then you zoom out to clinical relevance all in one paper. It's, it's a really nice paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really well done. All right, let us take some email here. Uh, Alan, can you take the first one? Sure, as soon as I scroll down into it. Uh, Matt writes, hello, TWIV team. Uh, my name's Matt. I'm a veterinary student at Washington State University. I just got listening to, got done listening to the latest TWIV episode while walking home from school. I'm pleased to report that it's currently minus 17 C with no wind and clear sky. Uh, fascinating and informative episode. I remember reading the abstract of the Pandora virus paper while working during the summer and getting that excited feeling when something novel is brought to one's attention. There are many questions, but I think this one has the most potentially exciting answer. Considering that these viruses, and presumably others like the two described in the science paper, had so little in common with currently available databases, is it possible that they, or at least fragments of their genomes, have been identified before but simply discarded? For example, if you're taking a sediment, water, or other sample and doing some brute force sequencing on any recoverable DNA, one of the first sensible things to do after getting the sequence off the machine is to blast or otherwise compare to known databases. The stuff that doesn't match up at all would be discarded as junk or sequencing error. I wonder if one were to go back through old data from many different studies and get their raw sequencing data, if you would see similar sequences. If the researchers, however, were not doing targeted sequencing, for example, 16S genes, this would uh, likely, or were doing targeted sequencing, uh, this would likely not recover any of these viral DNAs and would be a bust. Perhaps Chantal or Jean-Michel are interested in a new student to help figure this out. Either way, I'll certainly have many exciting papers to read this weekend to catch myself up. Um, yeah, I, it's an interesting question, but um, my my take on that would be that these these metagenomic sequencing projects. Uh, I mean, there are two ways to look at microbiome samples where you're trying to sequence everything. You could either do ribosomal RNA sequencing, um, and you're looking specifically for evolution of the RNAs, or you do metagenomic sequencing where you just shotgun sequence everything in the pool and you try and piece together bits of genomes and and see who's there. Um, metagenomic sequencing is where you would have found these sequences, and this is a very recent development. Um, so you don't have decades of data to go back to. You have maybe a decade of data, and, and really a lot of that was some very early papers and then kind of a boom lately. Um, so I don't think that there's a whole lot sitting in people's, um, in people's old data that would point to these viruses, but, you know, if that, if the data are easily available, it certainly wouldn't hurt to look. I think it's a good point, and I understand there, what you're saying, Alan, um, and I just don't know how much, so basically, you would have to do total sequence on recovered DNA, right? Not just 16S right. to, to build up this database. Yeah, I'm, I do not know. Maybe some of our listeners know the extent of that database. I'm not, I'm not aware of it, but that's a good point. You could be missing it if you had it there. Well, I just think of it in, in the sense that if you had gotten some sequence that didn't match anything in the database in the past, you would just say, well... Pfft garbage and throw it out and not have any way to deal with it. Just like when you do cloning and you would get garbage clones. You know, it's not, at that point, it's not worth spending any time on. But it could well be that some of those garbage sequences were something like this. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, Eric, um, Eric, what was his name, who we had a twiv with? <laughs> Eric Delwart. Thank you. Eric Delwart calls it dark matter. All this DNA that you sequence that you get and you can't figure out what it is and who knows maybe in there are 
organisms that you don't know about. Yeah, and even though it's been a short time that people have been doing these metagenomic studies, um, in that short time they have produced petabytes of data that they've got piled up, uh, well hopefully piled up and archived on on piles and piles of hard drives. Uh, so there there is an awful lot that's been done in a short period of time and yeah, a lot of it comes back to nothing in the database and now that you have these sequences, um, hopefully people are going back to their old data and, and doing blasts on them again um, to see if they stumbled on these earlier. I'm going to, uh, I just heard from uh, Jean-Michel Claveri, who is one of the discoverers of Pandora virus. He, he wrote me an email yesterday. He says, we have a neat paper coming out in February. Look for it. So, but I will send this to him as a response to that, see what he thinks. It's a good idea. Uh, Kathy, can you take the next one? Sure. Andy writes, I saw this hypothetical vaccine ad that markets them the same way pharmaceutical companies market drugs, and I thought the TWIV crew might enjoy it. And he sends a link, and I think we talked about this a little while ago uh, that another listener had sent this in. Um, it was the one that uh, was really kind of satirical. Uh, there was a line that use of vaccines without proper birth control can lead to explosive population growth. <laughs> Yes. Um, and things like that. So it's uh, it, it's a good thing worth yeah. looking at if you haven't yet. Do awesome. not take vaccines if you've chosen to die of the mumps. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I didn't know we had seen this before. Okay. Good. All right. The next one is from Jeffrey, who writes: Doctors, the electronic data age brings banes and boons. It allows for a proliferation of online publications. Boone, Bain, or both, take your pick, but it may offer some innovative advances in science review slash authentication as well. In listening to your discussion in episode 257, I had some intriguing thoughts on the process. Publications that wish to retain peer reviewing should do so. I think that it has a place. They will, however, be responsible for improving the process. Those who retain the current methodologies will be left behind in reputation. On the other hand, there's a lot to be said for publications like PLOS that will publish any article that meets their minimum guidelines and publication fees. However, such publications should have, in my opinion, an absolute obligation to publish disconfirming papers as well. The journals could provide well-organized comment sections in which peers, probably not the general public somehow, could attach comments and analyses of the paper, including proof of fraud. Even discredited papers could remain online with the history of their discreditation. The journals would also provide well-organized follow-up sections in which other groups could publish attempted duplications of the original work. I feel that such a core structure would provide a very robust distributed peer reviewing. It would provide a history of attempts to duplicate works as well as provide a place to record the effects of lab-to-lab -lab variations and techniques, resources that, to my knowledge, is sorely lacking in today's research environment. Such an approach could also open up avenues for publishing negative data, also a resource sorely lacking in today's research environment. Well, thanks for all your hard work with the podcast and providing me a chance to think a little deeper on possible ways to use the Internet to improve science authentication. I think it's a good point that, and I think we discussed in 257, as we have many times, our ideas about where public science publication is going, and I think it's a good idea to not impose a single view on all journals, but to let some continue peer review. But this idea of not having peer review, is, which we mentioned then, uh, and letting scientists publish their papers and then you get comments on them, I think is a good idea, and this is a good variation of it. What do you think, Alan? Uh, well, first of all, PLOS does use peer review. Um, yes. It's just the, the distinction with PLOS One, and that's the only one of the PLOS journals that's tried a, a slightly separate approach, is that they, uh, they ask their peer reviewers if the study is methodologically sound. In other words, um, do the results uh, support the conclusion? And that's the only thing they care about. They don't care about um, you know, impact or significance or you know the, the sorts of things that, that drive the so-called vanity journals like Nature or Science. Is this going to make headlines? Uh, PLOS One will publish it even if it's not, as long as the science is consistent. Um, so that's the standard there, but it does rely on traditional peer review. 
and uh, PLOS has comments. You can comment on articles there. That's had um, mixed results, to put it uh, <laughs> gently. Um, a lot of people hate that. A lot of people say it just needs some, some refinement to work well. Um, and in fact, it has, it has accomplished a lot and has um, gotten a lot of people talking to the point that um, NCBI, which runs PubMed, recently launched PubMed Commons which is a comment system for PubMed. And what they're trying to do is learn from the experience that PLOS has had and that other journals have had with opening up comments. Um, and they're trying to keep it a little bit reined in. Uh, as anybody who runs a blog knows, if you just open up comments to anybody, you get spam and trolls taking over. Um, so with PubMed Commons, anyone, in order to comment on an article, you have to have a previous a previous publication in PubMed. Um, that said, a whole lot of people have previous publications in PubMed and can get into the system, uh, but you're doing it under your own name, which provides some degree of accountability. So this is this is the kind of thing that's being rolled out, and in, in the case of PubMed, it's being applied to journals that have traditional peer review, but it's being done on an on external site um, where the journal doesn't have direct control over the comments. Maybe the comments on, on a paper like, like that we're talking about here would have to be moderated, even though that's a lot of work. Maybe that would be a requirement. Yeah, and at the same time, there are a lot of sites, um, major sites that have, uh, what was it, Popular Science that recently, um, or was was it Popular yeah. Science or Scientific America? It was Popular it's Science. Pop Sci, Pop Sci, yeah. um, they turned off comments um, because they were just getting, it, it was a huge um, load of work to have somebody there moderating comments. And if you don't moderate the comments, it's chaos. All the, you know, the 12-year-olds get on and, and behave like idiots. That's not an insult to 12-year-olds. No, they're, there could be adults that... Yes, there are adults <laughs> behaving, uh, yes, in a, in a childish manner. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, you get either chaos or you have to have somebody going through and patrolling constantly, and that person, of course, has to be paid, and there's the overhead of doing that. Um, and then there's research that says that, uh, particularly with science articles, oftentimes the comments spoil the educational aspect of the entire article. When people have, you know, they see some idiotic comment underneath a very smart article and they say, oh, this whole thing's stupid. Um, so, so yeah, PopSci went with just shutting them off. And other that generated a lot of discussion in publications about, well, yeah, maybe that is the way to go. Well, you know, I, I think if we ever go to a system, or at least if some journals go to a system where there's no peer review, but there's just publication and public comment, the public needs to be just the science, I think. And, you know, in any given field, uh, the people who work in it are, are few in numbers. So, you know, SV40 DNA replication, there are going to be 100 people who would be able to comment on it. So you have it moderated, and I think that would work because you wouldn't have such a huge volume as you would on a pop side blog, for example. I right. Can't see, I can't see any other way of doing it. You'd have to moderate them because otherwise you're going to get people commenting, and you have to get rid of those because they're not going to be appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, I they're... Don't, I, I don't mean people. I mean, I mean non-scientists not in the field. Yeah. <laughs> So I wasn't aware of this PubMed Commons thing, so it might be something that is new to others as well. We may want to include that in the uh, mm -hmm. the, the show notes. Yeah, that so was just think. recently launched, um, and there's and there's that's generated um, some some criticism as well. The idea of restricting comments only to people who've published, you know, there because on the other side of it, as Vincent says, you you kind of do want to do that because you only want people who have um, who have enough of a background to comment intelligently, but there are people who haven't published who may have enough insight or, or an outsider's view can occasionally be useful, not as often as outsiders often think it is, but, um, but that, you know, the question is what are your standards for allowing people to comment? Well, that's a really tough question because how do you identify the? Say you publish a paper on SV40 DNA replication. How do you find 
or identify the people that should be publishing. It's very hard. I mean, you have to basically have people register and check out their credentials, and it's a lot of work, and I don't know that anybody wants to do that. And you could never really insulate that from politics. So you could have some nasty academic dispute, I mean, uh, I, depending on the field, um, where so and Professor so-and-so doesn't want Professor such-and-such such commenting on his paper because they disagree, but they may have a disagreement that would be very informative to have in public. Um, so the scientists are people, and, and they sometimes <laughs> display unfortunate behaviors. Uh, that's absolutely right. And I think that's why, in large part, our current system has evolved to the point <laughs> where it is now. Because, uh, But even where it is now, you can have people trying to limit their competitors, right? So Sure. Yeah, peer review is, has a lot of problems with it, but um, the alternatives don't necessarily get rid of those problems. All right. That, thanks for that, Jeffrey. Uh, let's move to our next one. I think we're back to you, Alan. Okay. Varun writes, Greetings. Thank you for reading my last letter, Queries on HIV. I apologize for not sending you the link regarding uh, my question. So here I've reposted the questions with the links you requested. I recently came to know individuals producing a response against HIV N are more likely to have higher viral titers compared to people with a gag response uh, who have the opposite effect. Is there a mechanism for, uh, for that? Um, insights, please. I couldn't track the literature where I read it, but the research channel video should be of help. Um, and he points to a video of vaccines and HIV evolution, which I'm not going to autoplay right now because we'll have the audio on it. But uh, Vincent, you watch this? Yes. Yeah, so Varun, here, here's what I did. I went to the video, and then uh, when they gave the person's name who was speaking, I wrote it down, and then I went and I searched uh, on PubMed, and eventually I came up with papers that um, deal with what the people were. So in the video, they're talking in very broad terms, so it's hard to get any uh, information from that. But in the papers, you can see, for example, one that I picked up, which was published in Nature, preferential uh, CTL, cytotoxic T lymphocyte targeting of GAG, is associated with relative viral control in long-term surviving infected people. So basically what we have here are these are T-cell responses, so they're not antibody responses, and the T-cell responses are seen to correlate with uh, protection in these studies that have, have been done. So it's not that people with a certain response have the opposite uh, have higher viral titers. It's simply that the T cell responses correlate with protection. So that's so. I will put a link to that in the show notes, and you can follow up on that literature. Right. That paper is uh, in Cell Research, which is a Nature Journal, but not. Sorry about that. The main one. I just uh, saw the big Nature logo a, up yes. there. You know, Nature Publishing Group. You're right. You're right. That's right. Okay. Um, Okay, his second question was um, HIV elite carriers have elevated two LTR uh, two uh, long-term repeat circles in the nucleus that cripple HIV integration. Noting from other literature, I conclude there's not much difference in HIV replication steps in cytoplasmic events between elites versus non-elites. So is it reasonable to believe there's some, diver some difference in nuclear machinery, um, probably an enzyme or microRNA, uh, that is variant enough to be involved in this difference. Are there any studies enlightening us on this? And now we have a link um, to elite suppressors harbor low levels of integrated HIV DNA and high levels of 2LTR circle HIV DNA compared to HIV positive patients on and off heart. Um, right, so this is, this is a study looking at um, the at elite suppressors who are these people who have HIV and have not progressed with it. Um, let's see. So elite suppressors, um, there are probably many reasons why elite suppressors survive for long periods while being infected. We have talked on TWIV about uh, the fact that MHC molecules of certain types seem to be protective. It was a TWIV some time ago. There are probably other mechanisms. Um, I looked at these two papers which say that there are these uh, 
two LTR circular DNAs present. But as far as I can tell, none of this has ever been followed up with other studies. So I'm not sure that this is relevant to elite suppression. At this point, there's no data to ex other than a few papers that would suggest that. So I would say that there's nothing to conclude there yet. Right. And this is from February of 2011. So yeah. somebody, somebody should have followed up on this if it's okay. that's going on. I was just going to say, I remember um, looking at these links a couple weeks ago when they were in the email queue. And from between the two papers, I saw there was, it seemed to me there was a slight difference even in interpretation. Um, one seems to think that uh, inhibition of HIV replication steps is important in the uh, elite controllers. And the other one says that it's not, uh, it's not a specific uh, something about reverse transcription. So, so maybe, maybe they would be uh, in total agreement. But even between these two papers, it just didn't seem like um, there's complete agreement on this yet. Okay, Kathy, can you do the next one? Okay, mm that's Larry. Larry. Larry writes. How might these megaviruses relate to Margulis's conception of symbiogenesis? Could large viruses have become a part of the cell or play a role in the gene transfer on an evolutionary scale and how could one know? And this sounds a little like the debate that uh, Vincent that you alluded to is going on among the large virus people that uh, were at the meeting you were in where um, it's is it that the viruses have become part of the cell or uh, have has a cell become a virus? Am I reading that correctly? Is that, is that where the debate lies? Yeah, so it, the debate is whether the virus peeled off from the cell um, and lost genes or whether it peeled off from the cell as a small entity and gained genes. But there is also a theory that the, the, some viruses may have been the origin of the cell nucleus. So symbiogenesis is that idea that two organisms merge, right? Right, okay. A new one. So there is a theory out there that the DNA viruses were the origin of the cell nucleus. So yes, it's possible, but <laughs> I just don't know how you would ever, ever, ever prove something like that. Yeah, so, you'd have to catch it in the act. So yes, Larry, um, they could have. So in fact, um, uh, we, I'll put a link to a paper by I think Patrick Fortier, who was mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, who has uh, talked about this idea that they originated from the cell nucleus originated from a DNA virus. So yes, it could have been, uh, as you say, but who knows. Uh, our next one is from Shane who writes, Hi guys, I recently read an article in UW Today, UW Today, which is making the social networking rounds for its seemingly far-reaching consequences. My first thought on reading this article was that a lot of work is done on comparing the ratio of synonymous to non-synonymous mutations. Well, if it turns out that a lot of our previously thought synonymous changes are actually not synonymous, would this work be invalidated? I had also a thought that evolution of prions could possibly be explained by this. I could be completely overblowing this or be completely wrong in my interpretation. I am just an IT guy after all. Thanks for the awesome podcast. Keep up the great work. It's a warm 29 degrees C with scattered clouds. Shane is from Australia. Alan, you had some thoughts about this? Uh, yes. This, um, this did make the rounds in my social media as well, but... <clears throat> with a somewhat different twist to it. Uh, so these news reports that came out right after this study are the direct result of a very large load of hype that was deposited onto um, a paper that came out in science. And it's a good paper. It's an interesting paper. Uh, it's like a lot of other papers that come out in science. It's not going to change the world tomorrow, but it uh, provides useful insights on important biological processes. Um, the press release took it from there and went off on this whole um, silly thing about a secret code hidden in the DNA and uh, coming up with a new term for the, for these uh, um, types of changes and calling them duons. Um, 
and uh, there's a there's a very good write up of all this by El- Emily Willingham um, over at Forbes, who um, who cuts through things quite nicely. Um, she she gets right down into what the paper does, explains what it does and doesn't do, and explains where the um, the news about this is coming from and how it got overhyped. So that's that's where I would point you for an explanation. Yeah, so this paper is actually interesting. What they do is a genome-wide uh, mapping of the overlap of transcription factor regulatory sequences and coding sequences. So we've known for years that that, that there are transcription factor sequences in the genome, and sometimes they overlap the genetic code. So here they looked at the whole genome, you know, all of our chromosomes, and they found that about 15% of codons also specify um, transcription factor sequences. So that's a number we didn't appreciate before. It's not that this is new, but we didn't know the extent of the overlap. And as Alan said, unfortunately the press release way overstated this, and that's that really got out of hand. And you, you have to think that the investigators either didn't look at the press release, or if they did, they didn't pay attention to it. I think in this case, the blame probably rests with the scientists. And and this comes up pretty often. I mean, sometimes an, over, an overzealous press person will will do it on their own. But um, in this case, the, the press release has quotes directly from the researchers, and it's an institutional press release. And I can only assume that the researchers were allowed to vet these quotes. So if they didn't say these things, they at least saw that they were being quoted this way and could have put a stop to it. Um, and uh, in their in their zeal to get the word out, I think they really stepped in it. My first thought when when reading the article itself was, um, so they're talking about the the coding sequences having some other function, and while um, I, I first thought of the Paul three situation, so in eukaryotic cells, polymerase three makes the <laughs> small RNAs. And control sequences for for those Paul three transcripts are found within the genes themselves. And here, the gene products are not ultimately proteins. But to me, it was the same kind of thing that you know, in the area of what you are considering to be the final gene product, there are some sequences that are involved in control of that product being made or something like that. I just thought, oh, this is just another variation on that theme. Yes. Okay, let's take one more. Uh, I think it's your turn, Kathy. Okay, Joe writes, an example where mosquitoes respect national borders. Perhaps there's a language barrier. On the affected side of the island, French is spoken, while Dutch is spoken on the unaffected side of the island. Of course, there may be other explanations. (laughs) Okay, and so uh, I've forgotten what island it was. It's a Caribbean island. Saint Martin, uh, Saint Martin slash Saint Martin. That's right. Okay, um, one half is French, governed by France, and the other is governed by the Netherlands. And at the time of the writing, the virus was not on the Dutch side, um, and this is uh, chikungunya virus. Um, and so, uh, in the Americas, imported cases had previously been re- been reported from Brazil, Canada, French Guiana. Guadeloupe, Martinique, and the United States. But uh, by the time I looked at this a couple weeks ago, um, the uh, cases had been found on the Dutch side of the island as well. So maybe the virus uh, ignored the, I mean, uh, paid attention to the political boundaries for a while, but eventually, of course, as we expect, uh, ultimately ignored it. And there again, I've attributed, um, uh, I sort of anthropomorphized the virus. Sorry, Jane. There you go. <laughs> there, there are actually, um, I mean, of course, there are situations where a, a virus and even a mosquito-borne virus does seem to respect a national border, but you can usually trace it to drastic differences between the two countries. Right. We say many times on Twitter, viruses do not respect borders. <laughs> Anthropomorphizing aside. Let's do some science picks. Alan, what do you have for us? Well, this is not... Okay, this is a physics pick. I'll, I'll 
kind of push it in that way. Um, that's, that's science, right? Yes, that is science. Um, this is a completely goofy looking device that I, um, my snowblower broke last winter. Um, I, I hit a stick with it and I, I have parts on order to fix it, but they haven't arrived yet and then it started snowing already. So um, I was thinking, oh great, I got to shovel the driveway by hand. I need to find some a good snow shovel. And I came across this thing. Um, it looks like some silly gimmick, uh, but there were lots of rave reviews for it. So I went ahead and bought it. Um, it's called the Wovel. It's a, or, or the Snow Wolf. I don't, it, it goes under two different brand names. Um, it's a, a huge snow shovel. Um, with a sort of a lawnmower handle type of bar on it and a wheel, a really big wheel about the size of a, a large bicycle wheel. And you plow this thing through, the scoop on it is huge, you plow it through the snow and when it's full of snow you push down on your end of the handle and that catapults the, um, the snow out in front of you. Um, and I just this morning, I used it on eight inches of snow in the driveway. I cleared the entire driveway in just under 30 minutes, which is exactly how long it took me to do it with a snowblower. Hey, Alan, wow. did you take a video of this? I just have to I, see you doing it. Unfortunately, this. I do not have, I mean, it was just me doing this, and I couldn't, um, my wife was, get, was uh, you know, getting ready for work, and I couldn't bother her to, to shoot video. But I, I will try to get some video of myself um, using this thing at some point. So I don't get it. It just flips the snow in front. So eventually you have to go and you keep flipping and flipping and the pile gets well, higher if and you, higher. No. If you, um, if you do a good pattern going across the driveway at an angle, um, you can get all the way to the edge and then flip the scoop of snow off the edge of the driveway. I see. I see. All right. Um, I get, uh, how much was this thing, Alan? It was it was ridiculously priced for a snow shovel, but it's real cheap compared to a snowblower. It was 150 bucks or something. It's pretty wow. expensive for what it is. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I wanted. Is to the that. is the shoveling part made of metal or plastic? It is plastic, but there's a um, you can buy, and I did buy a little additional strip that goes on it that keeps it from from wearing out so fast and wearing out. Yeah, because uh, two years ago I bought a, a nice double wide shovel. But the plastic on it is is really going fast. Um, but this looks really cool, and it's it's fun too. And yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't hurt your back at all because you're pushing huh? down on this pump handle thing instead of lifting up with your back. Yeah, uh, I'd like to have it now because after we finish recording, I have to go out and shovel. My snowblower is horrible; it gets clogged, and. Um, I have a college-age son at home, who, and he shovels furiously for 10 minutes, then collapses. <laughs> yes. So uh, I have to but get something else. You might have to buy two of these, you know, so that you and your son could do it. Yes. I have, I have a very long driveway. I don't know. Yours may be as long as, as ours, Alan, but it's just... It's, yeah, ours is long enough that it's pretty painful to shovel, but I, I had no problem with this thing. It made a huge difference. Cool. All right. Wow. Yeah. And you're there was you going to get one, Kathy? I'm thinking about it. There was just a thing on uh, on the radio this morning about how if people left gasoline in their snowblower, it's uh, it's really bad because gasoline now might have 10% ethanol in it, and that when you start it up, not only doesn't let your the engine run, but it it degrades the engine. So. It's like you're out the whole snowblower. Boat so owners I've never... have this problem a lot these days now, <laughs> yeah. too. Yeah. So anyway, so I've never had these power things. Uh, I, for a while, used my mom's electric snow thrower, but um, it wasn't ideal. And uh, so this this could be the thing to get. <laughs> and if I get it now, that means when it, by the time it comes, we won't have any more snow the rest of the season, right? Exactly. I'm forget Mine just arrived uh, in time. It arrived a couple of weeks ago. It arrived right at at the end of our previous snowstorm, and now it showed up, and I was able to use it today, and I'm thinking, yeah, it was probably the end of the winter at this point. Yeah, one can hope. Yes. Cool. Kathy, what do you have for us? Let's see. I picked uh, something that uh, is these mind-blowing views. Uh, they were in the Huffington Post. Uh, some of them are short little videos, so uh, you just go to the page and, and look at them, and... Uh, the one that fascinated me the most was how a lock and key work. And 
I could I could have that on my screen for hours watching it. Finally, I realized that it, it was just going by so fast I couldn't quite figure it out, and so I just did screenshots of it so that I could study them in slow motion. Um, but there's some uh, biological things, there's zippers, uh, just really fun views of things. It's too bad Dixon isn't here because I think he would enjoy seeing these kinds of things, but that's my pick. These nice. are cool. Yeah, very cool. I like those, yeah. I don't think all locks and keys are, are uh, mechanical like that anymore, right, Alan? No, no, a lot of them are electronic now, but um, most of them, the regular... Um, you know the ones the ones on most door dead bolts on houses and probably your office are are all like this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I replaced one of ours with a keypad uh, thing, which is cool because you don't have to carry a key, but you do have to remember the combination. <laughs> right. <laughs> which, uh, since I'm really getting old now, is more of a problem. <laughs> well, you can also um, get ones that are using RFID chip. Is that ah. right? Yeah. yeah, in fact, a lot of companies now use these where the ID card has the chip in it, um, <clears throat> and you, you walk up to the door, and there's a little panel next to the door, and you hold your ID card next to the door. Um, in fact, when I lived in New Haven, I lived in an apartment building that had this set up, and I just carried the thing in my wallet. So I, would, I only had to carry the wallet, and I would just wave my wallet at the door thing, and it would open, um, which is kind of a metaphor for a lot of things in life, I guess. <laughs> All right, my pick is a Pew Research Center analysis on human evolution that was just published on December 30th. According to this new analysis, 6 in 10 Americans, 60% say that humans and other living things have evolved over time, while a third reject the idea of evolution, saying that humans and other living things have existed in their present form since the beginning of time. And 60% is the same as the last time this question was asked by the Pew Foundation in 2009. And the reason for that is that the 33% prevent the schools from teaching evolution so that the figures don't change. Yeah, that's right. Interestingly, these, belief, these beliefs segregate very strongly by religious group and also by political party affiliation. Who would have guessed that? Yeah. And now, today, 43% of Republicans and 67% of Democrats say that humans have evolved, and the gap has been widening since the last time. It's really a very sad poll, I think. Um, you know, to the idea that humans have lived, have existed in their present form since the beginning of time, it's just stunning to me that uh, you could believe this. But there you go. Uh, check it out. We do have a listener pick from Emily who writes, Twiv hosts, I love the show and finally have a reason to write in for my listener pick. This fall I began my PhD program in microbiology and immunology, although I'm focusing on virology and just finished my first rotation in a dengue lab. After a few months of staring at the virus crystal structure and countless hours playing around with pimole, pimole, by the way, is a program for visualizing 3D structures of proteins. I realized the virus was something I could easily build. All I needed to do was knit 30 envelope protein rafts made up of three E-protein dimers, of course, and connect them together following the threefold and fivefold symmetries of the dengue virus, then fill the virus. I opted for pillow stuffing instead of RNA and capsid protein and knit it shut. The dengue pillow was a gift to the lab and now lives there. It was a fun project to work on, and through making it, I have a better appreciation for the beautiful virus structure, seemingly complicated, but in fact quite simple. I know this will be the first of many projects combining my loves of art and science. Pictures are here, and she sends a link, and the oats rhymes with the correct pronunciation of my surname. Uh, thank you for the great podcast. I eagerly await each new episode each week. Emily, P.S. The weather where I currently am, uh, Parate, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, is a brutal 38 degrees Celsius, 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Well, these are just gorgeous. These are this. awesome. Yeah. I, she sewed I, the subunits before she sewed them together, which is mm -hmm. cool. And the final virus, it's gorgeous. It's about uh, a foot in diameter, I would say, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, roughly yeah. a foot. It's maybe about, about soccer ball size, I guess. Yeah. I, I sent it to two of my knitting friends already, and they, yeah, it's just amazing. It's really and great. So this will be our episode picture. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Shoot with the hand in there to give it an, an image of size, right? That would be good. Probably, yes. yeah, that would be good. Yeah. This is gorgeous. I yes. hope you make other cool things, Emily. We look forward to them. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really nice. It's neat how people. I know people make viruses out of beads, and glass, and all sorts of things. And this is. I think actually, I may have come across some knitted viruses before. To look them up. Anyway, but that's I, great. I I like her comment that in doing it it gave her a better appreciation for the structure itself and you know so that's it's a good learning tool from that yeah. sense absolutely absolutely you get to learn the symmetry and how things are built and if you don't want to knit you can just go buy a glass uh, thing you said you get a you get a good appreciation for the subunits as well all right that's it for twiv 266 the first of 2014 i have to get used to writing 2014 now. You can right. find TWIV at TWIV.TV and at iTunes and if you like the show go over to iTunes and leave a comment or a rating. That helps to keep us more visible. Do send us your questions and comments to TWIV at TWIV.TV Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. And Alan Dove is... Where is Alan Dove? He's at alandove.com and on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. You know, when I'm looking at the camera, I forget what... <laughs> you, yes, I'm also at turbidplack.com. Yes. I forgot to say turbidplack. Okay. See, I'm trying to be good and look right in that little green <laughs> LED. It's tough, isn't it? Yeah. And I forgot uh, what I was supposed to say. Yeah, it is tough. You have a lot of practice, though. Anyway, thank you, Alan. And Happy New Year to Alan and Kathy. Thanks. Likewise. Same to you. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. Let's see if I can close the show looking at the camera without forgetting what I'm supposed to say. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.